it's Scott Manley here. Now, many of you have been asking about this story about the imminent death of the Proton rocket, you know, the great uh, workhorse of the Russian uh, rocket fleet that's carried many great payloads into space. It carried Salyut stations, Mir, core parts of the International Space Station, and from 1996 it started carrying commercial payloads. Now, recent comments by uh, the Dmitry Rogozin, the guy that runs Roscosmos, has basically said that Proton is in the process of being sunsetted and replaced with the Angara rocket. So, uh, yeah, let's talk about Proton. Proton is uh, an interesting rocket in many ways. First of all, it was originally pitched as part of a much larger proposal. It was originally called the UR500, UR for Universal Rockets. This was going to be a series of rockets that would kind of use common parts and common uh, molds, common engines, so that you could kind of bolt them together and make you know, serve whatever purpose was necessary. The SS-100 is the smallest one, and it is a rather successful ICBM, which was originally deployed in the 1960s and has been given the NATO designation of the SS-11. There's been a few evolved versions of that since then, but um, the SS-200, it was kind of a logical step. They added more stages, they made it taller. It was going to be an even heavier ICBM. And uh, you know, Khrushchev was a big fan of it. He wanted to build his fractional orbit orbital bombardment system using it. But uh, when Khrushchev was ousted from power, the uh, project was shut down after a couple of launches. The SS-500, sorry, not the SS-500, the UR-500. Oh yes, the UR-500 was the Proton. But the original Proton proposal, the original UR-500 proposal, had four SS-200s bolted around in a square, and then in the middle they added an extra stage on the top to make this monster rocket that kind of resembles something you would build in Kerbal Space Program. And actually, in many ways, I think the Proton and uh, the other UR series rockets have a lot in common with Kerbal Space Program because they use the same size tanks, because they tended to use similar engines. Uh, you get this whole thing where in Kerbal Space Program you bolt together tons of different engines and tanks to make your rocket work. Well, that's what the UR series of rockets did. Now, yeah, the, the four S uh, UR-200s didn't end up happening. There was a second one where they would stack to uh, their fuel and stuff on top of each other, making it look a bit more like a commercial rocket, but that wasn't used because it made the rocket too tall. The final UR-500, which became the Proton, has these six tanks arranged around a, a central oxidizer tank with a, engines attached to each of these external tanks. Now, many people actually, when they see the Proton for the first time, if they're rocket fans, they kind of naturally assume that these tanks with engines are detachable boosters that are going to come off partway into flight. But no, no, the, the whole stage just detaches at the middle and falls off. The reason for this six tank with a central tank design was that they had to put it on rail cars and there were limits to how long they could make it and how wide they could make it. So each of these tanks would be put on an individual car and when they got to the launch site they would be bolted together and the launch vehicle would work. Interesting story, the, uh, for one of the first tests of uh, a test article, mock-up, they wanted to make sure it could carry all the fuel that would be loaded into it. So they set it up on the launch pad and then they needed to fill it with a fuel substitute. They didn't want to fill, fill it with real fuel because real fuel is really toxic stuff on the uh, Proton. So instead, they would use something like water, except that Baikonur was pretty damn cold at that time of year. So they came up with alcohol, 40% alcohol. They had like you know, two dozen rail cars full of the stuff and they filled this rocket with hundreds of tons of vodka. I mean, that's not the most Russian thing ever. I don't know what is. No, seriously though, the, the rocket did, uh, well, as I said, the rocket was originally pitched as a kind of a dual purpose ICBM. Back in the 60s, it was a lot easier to get funding for your rocket project if you could also pitch it as an ICBM. So the SS-100 was a, or sorry, the UR-100 was the, like a small one, the UR-200 was a bigger one, and the UR-500, they actually pitched that as to be the ICBM that would carry the Tsar Bomba, the 100 megaton warhead. Didn't happen that way, but the, it was eventually used as a launch vehicle, obviously. Uh, it also kind of ran in competition for the Soviet lunar program. Now, obviously, the N1 was what Korolev wanted, 
is a massive rocket that was fueled by uh, kerosene and liquid oxygen, but the designers of the UR-500, uh, they proposed the UR-700, which would be bigger. It would enable direct ascent, a direct descent and ascent from the moon. And it would be fueled with, you know, um, high, <laughs> what do you call it? Uh, Hypergolics, yes, I forgot the word. Hypergolic UDMH and dinitrogen tetroxide. Oh yes, the nasty stuff. Korolev, who of course had been the guy behind the Soyuz and the, the R7, didn't like hypergolics because with the uh, hypergolics, not only could they catch fire and burn you to a crisp, if you just dipped your toe in them, they could poison you or corrode you or everything else. Uh, Valentin Glushko, on the other hand, the guy that designed the engines for the R7, who had worked with Korolev, he was much happier with the prospect of using hypergolics. And so, yeah, they, they proposed the uh, UR700, which would be massive. It would be even more curable. It would have boosters strapped to the side. It would actually have cross feed uh, from the outside engines to the internal ones, and those would peel off. So they actually had asparagus staging in their design. Obviously, that never got picked. I mean, both, let's, let's face it, both the N1 and the UR700 both failed. But the N1 was given the option to fail more spectacularly than any other rocket. Uh, on the UR front, they actually went even bigger. They talked about a UR900, which you just had like an even more, even more layers of boosters. It was literally the Kerbal philosophy of add more boosters. This was gonna be to carry out crewed Mars missions. That obviously never got anywhere. <laughs> It would have been bigger and crazier, and you know, some uh, people looked at these designs and they started to say, well, wait a second, what happens if you know, something carrying all this hideously toxic propellant crashes? Wouldn't that just render the crash site essentially a dead zone for you know, decades? And of course, uh, the designers came back and said, oh, don't worry, our rockets don't fail. But of course, uh, fate has a sense of humor. And in 1969, a Proton rocket, or a UR-500, taking off from Baikonur, very quickly crashed after launch, releasing a massive toxic cloud of gas. And yes, the VIPs that were on hand to watch this glorious event, they went scattering in every single direction. And from that point on, I understand that the love of hypergolics kind of waned a little. The, there, were, there was actually a later UR700M proposal in 1972. This would be, again, uh, you know, a, another Mars proposal. It's, uh, it, it was using kerosene and liquid oxygen by this point. Although, I believe I've seen variants, uh, notes, references to upper stages that use things like uh, liquid oxygen and liquid fluorine, or a nuclear stage, or even a nuclear stage with a methane liquid oxygen afterburner. None of these get built, but it does sound pretty awesome. So yeah, the Proton rocket, as we know it, it got its name in the traditional Soviet way. The first payloads that it carried were Proton satellites. And so the UR-500 became commonly known as the Proton rocket. But it would still be secret for some time. It wasn't actually properly shown launching a payload until uh, 1980s when it launched the Mir space station. And it would be a decade later that commercial operations would get to use it. And now, you know, it's uh, been doing pretty well. But about five years ago, they started to have a run of bad luck. Because, of course, Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, and uh, their commercial launch um, capabilities, they, they'd been the cheapest game in town. If you wanted to launch a satellite, they were a great place to go as long as it wasn't some satellite that you didn't mind the Russians getting their hands on for a little amount of, you know, for some small amount of time. So, uh, yeah, they were, they were doing great business as a commercial launch program, but about five years ago, they just started to have a lot of bad problems with the protons. Uh, there were cases where the upper stage failed because the manufacturer had uh, substituted some cheap metal instead of some expensive alloys. And in 2003, uh, 2013, there was probably one of the most spectacular launch fail failures ever, where a proton took off off the pad, looked a bit, little bit drunk, and then flipped over, crashed into the ground. And this was because an engineer had installed three of the motion sensors upside down. So that run of bad luck pushed their insurance rates up. And that meant that their cost advantage kind of evaporated. And at the same time, 
SpaceX started making big waves. They started offering cheap, affordable launch capabilities. Yes, they had their own problems, but SpaceX had price advantage and uh, they've been reliable enough compared to the Proton. The Proton essentially has no future commercial launches on it. The only one I can see in the launch schedule is for something called Proton Medium. Proton Medium is a slight redesign of the Proton rocket, which uh, was going to lengthen some stages and get rid of an extra stage. And yeah, it was proposed. The design bureau has not got any funding for it. Neither Roscosmos or private investors are prepared to, uh, to fund this design. So that launch uh, from Eutelsat is essentially dead in the water. Uh, there was going to be a hydrogen upper stage. Hasn't happened again. Funding has been stopped. It's dead. Angara is the way that they're going to go forward with this. And it's going to launch from different launch sites. I mean, you know, it's, it's really a shame because uh, it, it not only represents the end of Proton, but it's also going to take more launches away from Baikonur. Angara launches from Plisetsk, um, you know, and most of the target orbits are available from there. The only things that are Baikonur is really needed for is for the International Space Station now in any low inclination, low altitude orbits. So it's not happening right away. It's going to take some time. There's a few more military payloads to go, certainly in the next few years. Uh, I don't see any commercial interest in keeping it running. And yeah, whenever Angara starts working, that's what's going to happen. Of course, Angara has only launched a couple of times. Uh, it remains to be proven as a, a launcher. You know, SpaceX is just eating the, the market. And yeah, it's kind of sad, but also, it's amazing that this thing kept running for so long. It really is an icon, an ugly icon. It is probably one of the most Kerbal rocket designs I've ever seen, but I can't help but love it and also understand that it is a darn ugly rocket, you know, for all the love that I give it. So yeah, 40 plus 50 years, yeah. Good run, it's been a good run. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe. Mm -hmm.